Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Warm welcome to Sunday worship, and uh, welcome to if you're a visitor present with us among us here today. Also, a welcome to those who are joining us on Zoom. It's always good to have you with us. Tea and coffee are served downstairs in the large hall after the service, and everyone is warmly invited to that time of fellowship. If you look at your uh, dates for your diary, uh, underneath the Cafe St. Clair intimation, you'll see there's a number of uh, intimations there. First of all, this afternoon, uh, there is a meeting of the Messy Church planning team, uh, and that's taking place um, after today's service. Have your coffee and meet in the Rosslyn room. On Monday the 2nd of September, the Guild resumes for its new session, and the following day is the Finance Committee meeting at 7 p.m. On Saturday the 7th of September, the Saturday coffee mornings resume, and on Tuesday the 10th, you'll see session meetings begin once again for our busy term. These are all the church notices. Now let us worship God as we sing to his praise and glory. Mission praise 307. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. We sing this twice. Jesus said, a man is looking for fine pearls, and when he finds one that is unusually fine, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that pearl. Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we draw close to you as pilgrims on a journey of faith. We gather as your faithful people and we marvel at all the good things you have given to us as we travel the road of life. We value our friends and family, the gift of our faith, and our place within the worldwide church. Above all, we value our relationship with you and the priceless gift of eternal life. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the hidden treasure, the pearl of great price. Your kingdom is like a field filled with gold of immeasurable worth. Your beauty and value surpass all the riches this world can afford. Yet in the face of your glorious kingdom, we confess our preoccupation with earthly treasures. We think of those times when we have sought after fleeting possessions, neglecting the enduring riches of your grace. 
times when we have prayed at your eternal kingdom for the fleeting promises of this world. Forgive us, Lord, when we miss the signs of your kingdom and the signs of your presence among us. Forgive us when the voice of temptation speaks loudest and earthly treasures seem more precious than the wonders of your grace. Help us to see this world with spiritual eyes and to value our relationship with you above all else. Help us to seek first the kingdom of God and to know in our hearts that we have made the right choice in following your teaching and commands. So help us in our daily walk with you to grow in wisdom, compassion and love, valuing service above self and finding lasting joy in our daily discipleship. All these things we ask as together we share in the prayer which you taught to your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue as we sing together Mission Praise 590, 590, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I'd like to ask Margaret Horn to come forward and she's going to lead us in our next section of worship.
The Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the book of Job, Job chapter 28, reading from verse 13 to verse 28. Wisdom is not to be found among men. No one knows its true value. The depths of the oceans and seas say that wisdom is not found there. It cannot be bought with silver or gold. The finest gold and jewels cannot equal its value. It is worth more than gold, than a gold vase or finest glass. The value of wisdom is more than coral or crystal or rubies. The finest topaz and the purest gold cannot compare with the value of wisdom. Where then is the source of wisdom? Where can we learn to understand? No living creature can see it, not even a bird in flight. Even death and destruction admit they have heard only rumours. God alone knows the way, knows the place where wisdom is found, because he sees the ends of the earth, sees everything under the sky. When God gave the wind its power and determined the size of the sea, when God decided where the rain would fall and the path that the thunder clouds travel. It was there he saw wisdom and tested its worth. He gave it his approval. God said to men, to be wise, you must have reverence for the Lord. To understand, you must turn from evil. The New Testament reading is in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13, reading first, verse 10 to 17, and then on to 44 to 46. Matthew 13, verse 10. The purpose of the parables. Then the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Why do you use parables when you talk to the people? Jesus answered, The knowledge about the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. For the person who has something will be given more, so that he will have more than enough. But the person who has nothing will have taken away from him, even the little he has. The reason I use parables in talking to them is that they look, but they do not see. And they listen, but do not hear or understand. So the prophecy of Isaiah applies to them. This people will listen and listen, but not understand. They will look and look, but not see, because their minds are dull, and they have stopped up their ears and have closed their eyes. Otherwise, their eyes would see, their ears would hear, their minds would understand, and they would turn to me, says God, and I would heal them. As for you, how fortunate you are. Your eyes see and your ears hear. I assure you that many prophets and many of God's people wanted very much to see what you see, but they could not. And to hear what you hear, but they did not. And then on to verse 44, the parable of the hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven 
is like this. A man happens to find a treasure hidden in a field. He covers it up again and is so happy that he goes and sells everything he has and then goes back and buys that field. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this. A man is looking for fine pearls, and when he finds one that is unusually fine, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that pearl. Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. The next item of praise is Mission Praise 744. We've a story to tell to the nations. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It seems to be a fact of life that people love treasure. From our earliest days, the thought of hidden treasure 
seems to captivate our minds. Just tell any group of kids that they're going on a treasure hunt and they'll go wild with excitement. One of the most successful books ever written, of course, was Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Some people try to seek their fortune by hunting for sunken treasure, risking life and limb in the perils of the deep in the hope that they can reap fantastic rewards. There's no getting away from it. Most of us are excited by the thought of treasure. No wonder it's a favorite theme for film studios and TV companies. The prospect of becoming rich overnight has always had a certain amount of appeal. But the theme of hidden treasure was also a favorite in Jesus' day. So you can just imagine the reaction to Jesus when he said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Wandering minds would have become quickly focused. Anyway, in ancient times, it was quite common for people to bury their money. If there was nowhere to leave your money, the safest place was in the ground where it would be hid, kept hidden from thieves and robbers. So Jesus pictures a man who, by chance, stumbles across this type of treasure. He's probably a peasant farmer plowing his rented land. Suddenly, his plow unearths this treasure, which has been hidden for years, if not decades. Making sure that no one has spotted him, he shovels back the earth, rushes home, and scrapes up every penny he has in order to buy the field. Now, this might make the man look dishonest, but remember that he could have just taken the money there and then. Instead, he decides to buy the land and afterwards he would become the legitimate owner of all that it contained. We learn that the man found the treasure and his focus then became on nothing else. He wouldn't rest until that treasure was his. Well, God's kingdom is that precious. It's worth giving up everything in order to secure it. In short, Jesus is saying, let nothing come between you and God's kingdom. Nothing is more valuable. Nothing is more lasting. Nothing is a better investment than the spiritual treasure of God's kingdom. Let's face it. The man would have been incredibly stupid if he had just found the treasure and then walked away. Coupled with this parable is the parable of the peril. Down through the centuries, perils were highly prized for their value as well as their beauty. Since Roman times, Scotland's rivers, including the River Tay, have been known for freshwater peril mussels. According to Wikipedia, the Abernethy Peril was found by William Abernethy in 1967, and it was reportedly valued at £10,000, which is roughly the equivalent to £200,000 in today's money. Some historians believe that the exceptional quality of Scottish freshwater perils was one of the reasons why the Romans invaded Scotland. And unfortunately, peril fishing in Scotland was made illegal in 1998. So if you were thinking on going and getting some from the River Tay, you've had your chances. Anyway, in ancient Rome, perils were highly prized and worn by Roman citizens in order to show their social status. Apparently, Julius Caesar presented the mother of Brutus with a peril worth in the region of a half a million pounds. Imagine if that peril had come from the River Tay. We might have asked for it back. But also, Cleopatra is said to have possessed a peril 
and it was worth several million pounds. Well, on this occasion, Jesus pictures a merchant who is looking for fine pearls. Of course, there are many, but there's only one of great price. And when he finds it, that merchant doesn't hesitate. He goes out and he sells everything that he has and buys that peril. No price is too great to pay because it's just too priceless to miss. And the reason the peril is too priceless to miss is because Jesus himself is that peril. Jesus himself embodies the kingdom of God. That's why in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul speaks of Christ, in whom were unfathomable riches. Again, in his letter to the Christians in the city of Colossae, that's modern-day Turkey, he speaks of Christ, in whom were hidden all God's treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The type of wisdom and knowledge we read about in the book of Job. St. Paul reminds his listeners that to many people of his day, the treasure of Christ remained deeply hidden from sight. Little wonder that many of the Pharisees failed to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God. For them, more than most, God's kingdom lay buried just like undiscovered treasure. As a teenager, I loved the action and adventure film, The Jewel of the Nile. In the film, there is a pivotal scene between Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas. All along, Michael Douglas thinks that he has been searching for a priceless jewel, which will buy him a brand new boat. But Kathleen Turner has to explain to him that the priceless jewel is their traveling companion, a holy man known as the Jewel of the Nile. He was the Jewel of the Nile because of his holiness and his wisdom. Just as Michael Douglas couldn't see the Jewel which was before him in this holy man, the Pharisees could not see the priceless peril which was Jesus himself. So, of course, they would look and not see. They would listen, but not hear or understand. For they couldn't see that in a very real sense, Jesus was the embodiment of the kingdom of God. So why does Jesus tell these two stories? And what is he telling his hearers and us through them? Well, remember how he starts each of the stories. The kingdom of heaven is like. These stories are a picture of the kingdom. They point us to what it's like to be part of that kingdom. They make us consider the questions. So what is the treasure? What is the peril of great price? More importantly, who is the peril of great price? These two parables point us to the greatest treasure we can ever find. Lord Jesus, stumble upon Jesus, finding treasure in a field, who was implicated in the death of Stephen, the first century Christian martyr, and the first martyr of the Christian church. On his way to persecute even more Christians, Saul met with Jesus, and his life was completely transformed. For others, finding Jesus and becoming a Christian comes at the end of a long search 
exploring many different religions and spiritualities before discovering that priceless pearl who is Jesus. Either way, getting to know Jesus and trusting in Jesus is a life-changing event. It's beyond earthly value. For who could put a price on an encounter with the Lord of time and space, the creator of the earth and the heavens and everything beyond? Though the British crown jewels are priceless, they cannot be compared with this particular pearl. The merchant who spent many years comparing different pearls knew that when the greatest of them all came along, there was no contest. He knew that this particular pearl had no rival. Professor A.M. Hunter says, Our world contains many religions, with doubtless some grain of God's truth in most of them. But when the chips are really down, what else is there? Who else is there but Christ, God's precious peril embodied in a man? Of course, where Jesus is concerned, the wealth of the peril is a spiritual thing. It's not a material thing, just like the wealth of wisdom spoken about in the book of Job. No one knows its true value. It cannot be bought with silver or gold. The finest jewels cannot equate its value. And yet, and yet, God has given this treasure to us, his children. The wisdom spoken about in this passage is not earthly wisdom. It's godly wisdom, the type of wisdom that no one can do without. As Christians, we celebrate because we have been given the priceless gift of Jesus. We are the ones who have found the treasure. We are the ones who have found the peril, because we are God's children. But having found that treasure, having discovered this precious peril, it would be pretty foolish to do nothing about it. For one theologian has said, if it costs a person everything they have, that is a small price in return for gaining the kingdom. Remember how Jesus' own disciples gave up everything they had in order to follow him. They knew that the blessing far outweighed any cost. It was a blessing which would lead most of them to martyrdom, but it brought with it the priceless reward of eternal life. If we face sacrifices in our Christian life, is it any comparison to the reward which awaits us too? The mystery is that the blessing of faith is a gift which is not given to everyone. And we should count it a great privilege that the gift is ours. For just as God's kingdom was hidden to the Pharisees of Jesus' day, so the kingdom remains hidden for many people in our day and generation. They seek for treasure where they will not find it. And they look for fulfillment in places where it is not to be found. Yes, in the Christian life, there are sacrifices to be made. And these parables make that perfectly clear. The man who discovered the treasure had to sell everything that he possessed just in order to buy the field. The merchant had to sell everything that he had, probably including all his other perils, in order to obtain the only one he truly desired. 
For both these individuals, it meant sacrificing everything else they valued and held dear. But you see, to ask about the sacrifice actually misses the point. Because the rewards of the kingdom far outnumber any cost at all. When someone discovers the perils of the kingdom, the peril of the kingdom, any sacrifice can seem small by comparison. My richest gain I count but loss, as a favorite hymn rightly says. And most of us know that hymn of Isaac Watts concludes, Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Amen. Let's think about that now as we sing together Mission Praise 799, All I Once Held Dear. Let's remember our world in prayer. Let us pray. God of all creation, the world is filled with your goodness. All nature sings your praise. We give thanks for the stillness of night and the rest it brings, and for days filled with energy and creativity. Thank you for the summer with its changing rhythms that renew us, and for new relationships that enrich our lives. Lord, we seek the way of peace and harmony. And sometimes we come to you to escape our difficulties, for a solution to our problems, to find security. But you call us to take up our cross and to follow you into the world in all its complexity, 
all its difficulties, pain, and uncertainty. And so we turn our minds to your world and the things that burden our hearts and minds. We pray today for all the victims of the horrifying incident in Southport. We pray for the families of those who have been killed and pray that you will feel close to them in their grief. We pray for the injured and their families, for all those who witnessed the incident and the aftermath. We pray for those who are caring for the injured and bereaved and all those caught up in the events of the day and what followed. Lord God, we lament the state of our world today. The wars, the hungry millions, the countless refugees, the natural disasters, the cruel and needless deaths, and our inhumanity to one another. So help us to seek first the kingdom of God and to share the good news of Christ in our daily lives. Bless each one of us who are gathered in your midst. Minister to us as we share the worries and burdens of our hearts and minds. And leaving these concerns before your throne of grace, may we rest secure in your almighty hands. As pupils await exam results on Tuesday, we pray that you will be with all those who feel uncertain about the future. May you bless them with the fruit of their labours and guide them on their journey through life. We pray for the members of our church going through tough times and those who have experienced the sadness of bereavement. For those who have been in hospital through illness or accident and for those whose health has brought them worry or anxiety. May your Holy Spirit be a comfort and strength to all who are passing through difficult days. And may your hand be upon all who cry out to you. Gracious God, as we have received, free us to give. As we have been loved, open us to love others. As we have known peace, help us to make peace. In all the choices set before us, Give us the wisdom of the merchant who surrendered all to possess the blessings of your kingdom. For we ask all these things in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that pearl of great price. Amen. We sing together our next hymn, Through the Love of God.
remain seated as we sing the doxology, Praise God from whom all blessings flow, as the offering is brought forward for dedication. dedicate our offering to God. Dear Lord God, help us always to live with thankfulness in our hearts. Help us to find beauty in the world around and in unexpected places. If we stumble upon the treasures of your kingdom or find them after a long search, may we bless your holy name. To that end, receive our offering, our praise and our thanks for Jesus and his priceless kingdom. Amen. We now conclude our worship as we sing together mission praise number 77, Christ triumphant, ever reigning. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Go in the strength of the Lord, and let Christ be your constant companion. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen.